Okay, great. So, um, welcome to the uh, Center for Translational Research uh, in Richmond series. Um, what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. We touched on this, as many of you will recall, um, in the course of our strategic planning uh, uh, meetings. And it really involves the sense of identity. Who are we? Um, this is one of the five centers within um, the uh, Children's Research Institute. Um, but we're different in most of the other centers because we really don't have certainly an organ system that we focus on. We don't even have sort of a subset of biology that we focus on, um, like the, the Center for Genetic Medicine, or um, a, a specific therapeutic approach like the viruses in the shape diet. And so with, with that survival um, about a year ago, we sort of started to talk about this sense of identity. Um, and the strategic planning process was, as you know, had to be integrated with an institutional strategic planning process. Well, what was the place to really do some of this innovative thinking um, and the extent that, that we really wanted to? Um, and so now that that process is complete and, and sort of um, uh, all tucked in, uh, we felt it was a good time to revisit this. So today's uh, presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Boyer model uh, of scholarship. Um, and then um, uh, Lamia Pereira uh, is going to talk about understanding the Boyer model, kind of a demonstration um, case uh, in the context of uh, quality improvement. So let me just start um, by just giving you a thumbnail sketch of where we have been until very recently. So as you know, the first strategic planning process that we had in 2012, we decided that our large cadre, over 100 faculty members, a large cadre of faculty, really could be uh, character, character, categorized um, in three domains. So experimental therapeutics and molecular pathogenesis. Um, this is the, probably the smallest uh, group, but really is uh, John Vandenacre's um, uh, uh, efforts and, and the efforts in, in my research laboratory. Um, and, and part of the reason that it's so circumscribed is for a whole variety of reasons the center has never had last week. Um, uh, and so um, uh, that's, you know, an interesting sort of thing to think about. And I'm just going to put park it to the side um, uh, for right now because, you know, there, there may be in the next sort of five-year plan something that, that would uh, transpire to allow us to address um, that limited purview. But for right now, that, that's really not something that's open for discussion. A vast majority of our investigators are doing um, uh, clinical research, which is patient-oriented research. And just two uh, examples, one from Stephen's work um, uh, with uh, asthma, um, and another with um, uh, Jeff Oak's work with um, uh, arrhythmia. And then we have a large uh, cadre of investigators. The, the centerpiece of, of this investigative effort is really our research psychologists, but there are others who are interested in behavioral and community research. And so again, um, uh, work from uh, Leander Droy and uh, Lee Beers, both early, both often, um, and, and then also from uh, some of the work that we've done. We structured the center with these three major themes around the support of the Division of Biostatistics and Study Methodology, as you know, this is a research division. Um, and now we have a research division of bioinformatics. Um, and within that sort of research division, there is um, a, a, a focus on translational informatics that we share with the Center for Genetic Medicine um, and the CTSA program, our CTSI CN. Because we have a such a multi-dimensional, uh, multidisciplinary cadre of investigators, um, very early on we established an executive committee. So um, I serve on that committee as the director of the center. Beth is the associate director of the center. John Vandenacre representing um, experimental therapeutics and molecular pathogenesis pillar. Adelaide Robb representing um, the patient-oriented research pillar. Um, Randy Streisand, the behavioral and community research pillar. And then Pam Hine, who um, has been the organizing force for our special interest groups, where we uh, make a really dedicated effort to help cadres 
of like-minded investigators organized around themes. Those themes are operative for as long as they're there. We sundown some of the themes, we stand up new themes, and the reason organizationally that's important is because we provide support for these themes to bring in outside speakers um, uh, and to do the groundwork um, for thinking about multi-investigator plans. In terms of research, we have really covered the waterfront from um, sort of the T zero space with some of the things that we're doing in my lab um, into that, that transition from the laboratory to first in man study um, with uh, a P30 program that is the, um, the PKD program, if you will, that now will become a U54 with the next um, competitive renewal. And the urea cycle disorders program that, that is sort of split between GenMed um, and the Center for Translational Research. The, set, the piece that's with us is really the clinical trial. For patient-oriented research, great um, uh, programs uh, focusing on asthma, obesity, HIV, AIDS, clinical pharmacology, TX emergency care, and pediatric critical care. There is an effort in, in terms of the, the, the space between um, T2, which is um, application at the, at the level of uh, the clinic, um, into uh, a broader uh, application um, in populations, transitioning care, adherence strategies, community-based mental health, end of life and palliative care. And then finally, at the T4 end of the spectrum, there are policy kinds of considerations. And here is where our, um, uh, some of the, the work that we hope to build on going forward in health disparities and health services research would be positioned. But the issue is that when we asked ourselves what does success look like, we came up with a number of things that were beyond research as I just captured it to really be thinking about scholarship and leadership as scholars. When we asked who do we want to be, it was not having to do so much with research or a particular domain of research, but we wanted to be innovative, thought leaders, collaborative, and visionary. And then what do we want to be known for? Well, health outcomes is here. Um, again, being thought leaders, thinking about um, uh, outcomes, thinking about uh, case setting, advancing health literacy. Again, this doesn't fit neatly into the structure that we described in terms of research. <coughs> so the faculty in our center have a broad range of scholarship expertise. And scholarship is really defined by a number of folks, including perhaps one of the, the folks that is most widely recognized as a scholar of scholarship. Um, E.L. Boyer, as, a, as an endeavor whereby one asks a very specific, very well thought out question, then goes about gathering data to address the question, um, does uh, a, uh, a set of analytic procedures, and that can be very broadly defined, um, to, uh, to process the data and come up with new knowledge and a critical piece of scholarship, perhaps the centerpiece that defines scholarship is that you disseminate this new knowledge, whether it's a blog or a publication um, uh, or a variety of other avenues. It's information that moves beyond just the group that was asking the question. So you can say, well, what about a clinician who delivers great care in their clinic? Well, that's incredibly important. And obviously, it's incredibly important when you're thinking about child health and incredibly important here. But that doesn't get disseminated. And so while it is incredibly important and it is part of the portfolio of many of the physicians here, it's not scholarship um, as defined by E.L. Boyd. So what do I mean by that? Well, in a beautiful little uh, monograph, it actually is a very quick read. If folks would like it, I'd be happy to send the PDF. E.L. Boyer describes scholarship in an academic context. So here he was talking about a university <coughs> as having four main domains. There's the scholarship of the discovery of new knowledge. And so this is um, a, an approach that establishes new or theories or revises uh, theories that are, that are currently popular. Principles, knowledge, or creation. These words come from, from his monograph. So this is really discovering new knowledge, what we typically think of as hypothesis-driven research. The scholarship of integration, Boyer recognized in the 1990s 
that um, that to ask and address really big questions, one who very often needs to bring knowledge from two or more disciplines or fields to create new insights or understanding. The scholarship of application, using knowledge to address an organizational or societal issue with the intended goal of change and development. And then finally, the scholarship of teaching, uh, which he defined as developing the knowledge, skills, mind, character, or ability of others. This is lovely, but it does sound very academic, and what the hell does it have to do with an academic medical center? Well, I thought a lot about um, uh, Boyer's construct, because I think it really is very encompassing of what an academic health center aspires to be. So here are a few tweaks. The scholarship of discovery of new knowledge, or for short, discovery, I don't think we need to revise. We all understand what that means. The scholarship of integration. Now, maybe I've just thrown too much CTSA cooling, but to me, that sounds like team science, which is a major um, theme uh, for the CTSA in the current day and for our renewal application going forward. The scholarship of application, which we tweak just a few words, and they're shown here in italics. To address the clinical issue or problem with the intended goal of advancing clinical care, that's the scholarship of clinical care. Now, as pediatricians, we immediately can think of it, uh, several examples of this, but perhaps one of the most compelling is cystic fibrosis. Long before we had fancy targeted drugs that moved misfolded proteins out of the ER into the membrane so that there could be some activity of this chloride channel. We have the CF Therapeutic Network that focused in a rigorous way, rigorous attention to outcomes on how do we deliver antibiotics in the most thoughtful and um, a high impact, high quality way? How do we use pulmonary type toilets, again, in the most effective um, and high quality way? And how do we think about nutrition, which was an underappreciated um, aspect of caring for CF patients? I know this because I'm in a residency. These kids died in the late e in the in the their late teens and early twenties. And very often they were completely malnourished. We all saw it, but we didn't recognize the importance of good nutrition. Now we all know they have patients, have children, and many survive into their forties and fifties. That's not fancy drug development. That is the scholarship of clinical care. And then finally, the scholarship of teaching or education. And here you know, we have now the CSK program that Mary Orlini and others start, uh, uh, started. We have Mary Orlini's example, and she's a nationally, in fact, internationally recognized scholar of education. One of the things that occurred to, I think, both Beth and me is we had a number of folks coming to us writing grants about advancing education using principles of adult learning to help folks, you know, learn how to um, assimilate new information in a critical care setting. Um, we had folks coming to us thinking about new clinical programs that could advance clinical care for a particular disorder. We have lots of folks who are primarily their portfolio is the delivery of clinical care. But, you know, they go to the laboratory, which is their, hu their human uh, laboratory, which is a clinic, several times a week, see all kinds of things, and really have an awful lot to share in terms of refining um, questions. Those folks would operate in terms of scholarship in the context of team science. So, what we want to propose to you is to take our figure of the center and revise it completely to give equal weight to the scholarship of discovery. And you'll see those three themes are still there. The three pillars are still there. The scholarship of clinical care, this is one place where quality improvement research could fit and implementation science. The scholarship of team science, we welcome people to the center who are interested in participating in research programs, even if they're never going to hold their own R1. And then, of course, the scholarship of education. So that when people come, whether they're coming internally as faculty candidates or they're being recruited to, uh, to some of our clinical divisions, and that's what they identify as their area of scholarship, they have a home for them um, in terms of pursuing their scholarship and how we can support them in pursuing their scholarship. So 
So let me stop there before Becky introduces Lonnie, and Lonnie gives you a practical uh, perspective from her own um, experience and see what your reaction is and, and questions that you may have, um, insights you may want to offer. Can you, can you go back to the Behavioral and community research should also be used in scholarship of clinical care. So when you're talking about access to care and healthcare disparities, where behavioral and community research is also involved with CHI and how we get good care to people across the city or regardless of the zip code, I think that's part of intelligent care delivery as well. So, Emma, I was actually thinking of you when I did this because it could be, you know, as you'll see in, in Lamia's talk, there could be touch of quality improvement to a number of these sort of squares. But I was thinking about you and your colleagues in psychology who have worked so hard to disseminate broadly across our clinical footprint suicidal assessments. And, and that is improving the quality of care for our patients because now it's baked in. It's not something someone does on the fly or when they have a gestalt sense that maybe it's a question to be asked because you know so much, I and mean, you've taught me this, so much of, of, of what goes on, there are, there are no clear harbingers always. There are no you know, clear clues that someone might be in trouble. And so baking it into the way that we deliver clinical care is hugely important. So I was thinking about this. It's not meant, and the way, the reason this is drawn this way, it's meant to sort of say they are all connected in the center. And one of the things that would connect them is biostatistics, and bioinformatics, using information and using statistical analysis. What do you see as a relationship between like Kate and between Devesh and his office and the scholarship of education in the CPR? So the scholarship of education is people so there are some new faculty members who are writing grants okay. um, who are interested in pursuing scholarship. I mean, they have to lay out a proposal where they're asking questions. They're talking about data that they want to develop. They talk about how they'll analyze their data sets, and they have a plan for dissemination, how scholarship is defined. Kate does a lot of that, and prior to Mary leaving, that was something we certainly had talked about. Again, not to subsume Kate into the center, but to have sort of a, to be a federated relationship where some of, uh, of their faculty really wants to be in the center. Um, uh, in a CRI center and want support for some of their grant applications could be part of this center without shoehorning them in someplace that they didn't seem to be uh, having an obvious home. But as, you know, it may just be a Venn diagram and hopefully the overlap will grow over time. Just, just, you know, a couple of days ago I was sitting in a different meeting and I wanted to decide. Mahalo, can I stop you for a second? Sure. Does everybody know Mahalo? Mahalo is our new chief research information officer um, who's just come to us from NHLBI. God, smile on us. So, hello everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, so, the question was what do we need to make sure that the CDA is indeed successful? But, so, hold on. So, that's a very important question, and you know how anxious I am about the CDA. Mm -hmm. But this is separate. Right? This is the Center for Translational Research that is separate from our CTSA funded program. Oh, so it's so, so the CTSA funded program is research infrastructure. The centers in CRI, I probably should have put this diagram up, but I think people have seen it. Not everybody, obviously. It's one of the five research centers where investigators conduct research. What was so, so the quick lesson for me? Is CTSI tied to the center or not? CTSI, in, in, in a sense, if you, if you look at it from the perspective of NCAT, mm -hmm. the CTSI should actually be the link between CRI okay. and GW. So, so to Lisa's point, I'm new. Thank you. 
renewal application, Quality can have both an inward focus and an external focus. The external focus would be a scholarship. The internal focus is the quality that very often, at least in industry, is very impressive. We have these sorts of approaches to improve quality um, in our health system um, and reduce you know, X, Y, or Z in terms of adverse events, and that makes us more competitive in that market. Well, it's not necessarily scholarship, particularly because it's almost an anathema for those groups to disseminate that, um, that approach. But doing quality, as, as for example, what Lamia will talk about, um, is I think scholarship because you're trying to disseminate what you've learned to advance knowledge. Yeah, I think some of it just also comes down to where the funding streams come from, you know, internally within the hospital, and how to, it's not necessarily unify, but kind of direct, uh, have them flow together to support efforts that could cross, you know what I mean, like there's a separate educational funding stream for the hospital, there's a robust and separate quality funding stream in the hospital that aren't necessarily going towards the scholarship, but with the right people, so, so it's important to sort of then go back to the CTSA. So one of the things that we were very fortunate is we had great EMTs who had spent 16 years working for Toyota and, and very much focused on their lean uh, approach to, to um, uh, manufacturing problems. Um, and Brady brought that incredible knowledge to us about quality. When Brady departed, um, one of the conversations that I had very quickly was with Royal Shop. And Royal said, this is the perfect time. Because we've got a lot of the nuts and bolts about operational <laughs> quality now nailed down. And what I would like to do is expand into research around uh, quality. So actually, Raul is leading the quality piece of the CTSA to think about the scholarship and supporting scholarship of quality um, uh, related. And, 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 you know, I'm not sure that we can, we can address funding streams right now. Yeah. Major part of this was to be thinking about how are we able to lay out a foundational plan that really offers our members a clear place in the home that is essential. I mean, going, going back to the suicide example, because that's my newest one, part of what we were able to do with the safety people and the QA people from the hospital is incorporate one of the nurses from Cerner who is literally keeping metrics. And every month we get an update of how many people are screened and how many people are missed and what happens to everybody. And we've already got a publication team from the beginning. I said, we're going to do this and get out all this data. We need to get publications out of this so that for my faculty members who maybe aren't going to write an NIH grant but still need to have scholarships, we started from the beginning and everybody who's on the team is part of that, well not everybody, but the people interested are. They're meeting weekly to go over where we are, even the how do you set everything up paper because I think that's important because so many people who are busy clinically don't Think about how can they be incorporated in the academic part of an academic medical career. You just have to tell them. Well, I think, you know, your, make point, it available. your, your point is, is terrific on many levels, but one of the, the things that I think, and it gets to, to uh, Andrew's point as well, is the idea that these are not intended to be self systems that, you know, are wholly unto themselves. You know, one of the things that we talked about in our uh, our retreat, um, in our, our retreat planning or you know, planning session uh, around um, uh, you know, sort of strategic thinking, is the idea that we would like to be um, a catalyst and accelerator for interactions among folks in different centers. So there are quality aspects to a whole variety of things people do, whether it's first in human studies or whether it is genetic, incorporating genetic studies into your, um, uh, into your research plan. There are educational pieces. We've already hooked up um, uh, folks with, um, uh, with some of our scholars of education because they have, say, for example, a P30 or whatever, and they're, they're focusing on education, and they don't really know exactly how to get to where they want to go, having collaborative help 
someone who is a scholar of education would be helpful. So this is, is not meant to be hard and fast boundaries. It's really meant to be a platform that allows us to operate and make connections. online for your residents 
or for your fellows or the medical students and then turn it into a scholarly education. And then the other problem is if you're going to spend so much time developing a blog or developing a podcast, how do you account for that on your um, educational portfolio? How do you account for that as, a, um, as, a, as an educator or somebody who wants to get promoted? Where does that all fit in? So they um, started to mention this Boyer model, and sure enough, a few days later, I get the email about the Boyer model, and I'm trying to put two and two together. I'm like, okay, um, this is the children's, this is here. How, how, are the two, how, how, do, how are the two relating to each other? And then I finally put two and two together that we are talking about the same thing. We're talking about scholarship and, and going back to this whole idea of um, appraising the work that I have been doing. So that kind of, I thank Beth and, and Lisa because they made me actually think about all of the projects that I'm doing and try to plug it into all of the different aspects and all of the different facets of this model. So this is kind of um, where it all came from. So what I'm going to try to do is to the stuff that I've been doing kind of relate to you guys or try and relate the Boyer model to, um, to quality improvement. And what you're going to notice is a lot of the um, scholarship in quality improvement is going to fall into the clinical care piece, but it's also going to fall into the, which is the application piece, but it also falls in the integration piece. Um, again, integrating and making connections across, um, across disciplines. So I wanted to start with, uh, as a clinician, a bedside clinical problem. So I'm a neonatologist. I take care of tiny babies. And the commonest thing, remember, from medical school, first thing that you learned about babies is they're, they usually they're born, they're premature, they have bad lungs, right? Bad lungs, highline membrane disease, surfactant deficiency. You, um, you put the tube in, you give them surfactant. A few days later, they get better. You take the tube out, we're fine. Um, so here you can see normal adult. This is a newborn with respiratory distress syndrome. You can see that the lungs are hazy. This is the ground glass. If you ever wanted to see ground glass, this is that ground glass of urine. Um, and then we put the tube in, and of course the radiologist has the arrow. Any ideas? So pointing towards the tube and saying that the tube is sitting like right at the clavicles, and our ideal position should be probably a little below the clavicles. And what that means in, in an adult, if the tube's in at the clavicles, you're probably okay. It's like far enough in, it's safe, there's no problem. However, if you think of a little newborn, their necks are tiny. So if we kind of transpose that onto me, the tube's probably going to be about here. So if they cough, the <coughs> tube comes out. Or if they just like flex back, the tube can easily come out. So we have a problem with um, unplanned extubations. All the kids that we intubate and put on ventilators have um, potential of being of, of, of having their tubes out. So, so what? Who cares? <laughs> so, here's the problem. So, yeah, tube comes out, I can put it back in, right? But again, I have tiny babies, and I probably, while I'm putting it back in, I could nick the gums. It could be difficult, it could be really hard to put it back in. I can have so many tries that, the, that they get swollen that I can't put it back in, and the baby has hypoxia and bradycardia. They can have hypoxia and bradycardia while, they, while I'm trying to put the tube in, say, bagel. And then if you, um, if you look at the, that figure down the bottom, and the CI, they're so hemodynamically sensitive that once the tube comes out, they could actually arrest. And that's something that we, um, this, is, this is our data uh, from this year. It's not complete. But you can see in the NICU, we've had probably a little over this, but half of our kids get reintubated within the hour, half don't. But in the, um, in the, unfortunately, this year, we haven't had any that have gone into cardiac arrest. Um, our rates are around probably about 7% of the kids will arrest uh, from that event. But in the CI, you can see it's about 30%. So there, that, that just hemodynamic sensitivity from um, the extra cardiac load could do that. So again, uh, bottom line is extubations, unplanned extubations are bad. All right, so what are we going to do about it? So, where, where should we start with this problem? Dr. Peach. Um, I think you start with the people delivering care and, and talk to them about their challenges uh, and uh, try to understand from their perspective why these events are happening. Absolutely. Map out the process. Map out the process. What else? Figure out how many are due to having the tube up too high versus it's actually in all the way and something happens to pull it out. Right, so we're mapping the process. We're actually asking the frontline providers. We're, um, we're checking two positions. Other thoughts? Training. Training? Collect data. 
<laughs> of course, no, <laughs> which, which is kind of what we've been doing. Simulation, simulation around reintubation, around securing your tube. So, so traditionally, people started here. So this is from 1976, and we still do this. So this is the pattern for the. This is called the umbilical, um, the umbilical uh, clip method of securing the tube. So people normally, when you talk about this problem, they think of, oh my gosh, it's not taped good enough. Um, it's, it's a securement device issue. So the first place they started was thinking about how do I put an ET tube. So what they do is they take the umbilical cord clip, they drill a hole in the middle, they clip the umbilical, uh, they clip it around the ET tube, and then they tape it to the baby. Sounds pretty secure. So 1976, about 10 years later in 1998, they decided to actually study this. So I use this as a, um, just looking at the scholarship of discovery. So people started to think of solutions. So again, you find a solution, you compare it to the solution, the clinical solution you have. And sure enough, they found that um, it did reduce the rates of unplanned extubation. However, if you didn't talk to the nurses, you didn't talk to the nurses, so the nurses will tell you, if you put an umbi clip around the baby, you actually don't have access to suction them, and it's mm -hmm. kind of really hard to, to, um, to, to, to care for them. And then if it comes out accidentally, you, have a lot of, you take a lot of time actually getting the tube off mm -hmm. to put it back in. So it wasn't exactly the perfect solution. And in QI, they tell us there's no one silver bullet to anything. It's not just the problem of the clip and the tube and the securement device. It's probably a lot of multifactorial stuff, as you mentioned, so you knowing where your position is, talking to the nurses, talking to the clinical care team, and figuring out, um, and figuring out where to go from there. So again, um, other solutions, they came up with the neobar, they came up with the traditional, we use the traditional, okay, we actually use the one down bottom, we don't use that one. Um, why is this relevant? Because currently units that use the umbilical clip actually do have uh, lower rates, but it's not the whole story. They haven't reduced theirs to zero. They still have some degree of unplanned exhibitions. So again, one, one it, it did not make a com the complete story. So again, we talked about scholarship and discovery. So here's where QI comes in, and this is our data. So around um, 2007, um, the clinicians, frontline, Billy and the team, they noticed that uh, all of a sudden you walk into the unit and overnight the baby is extubated. And it happened frequently enough, it kind of drew their attention. So they started to collect some data around um, how many are happening, comparing it to how many, how many tubes we have or how many ventilators we have in a day. So it's always normalized for ventilator day. So unplanned extubations to 100 ventilator days. You notice around here, 2009, we moved to a new unit. We didn't have a lot of intubated kids. And then around um, 2010, um, one of our fellows picked it up as a project trying to look at how we can reduce that. And they implemented a variety of solutions. So one was um, putting markers in next to the ventilator telling people where the tube was. They decided to huddle after every event to kind of discuss what was happening. Um, they had an airway of safety protection team, so they called this kind of the bundle of, of, of uh, things to do. And sure enough, our rates went down, kept on following it. Um, rate, rate went down, down all the way in 2012. I wasn't at the institution at that time, I had just joined, so this was the tail end of John's fellowship. Um, and then I started to get, again, now I'm the medical unit director, I started to get really inspired around the summer of 2015. We started to notice a real huge spike, three months in a row. Instead of having like three or four excavations, we had like 10 to 15 horrible amount coming out. And the way I knew this was the fellow said, well, it's great. I learned how to intubate because every day we have an excavation. Yes. Put the tube back. <laughs> awesome. Not good. Good for them, not good for the patient. Um, so this time we started another quality improvement project. We kind of re-examined re uh, everything that we did. And then we added on a couple more things. One was alerting people when a patient was high risk. So we started looking for high risk markers. And we also did something that was a little paradoxical. We decreased the number of x-rays we're getting. So people would be getting x-rays and flipping the tubes and changing them a lot. So we wanted to decrease the number of times we manipulated them. Um, and sure enough, a few months later, we were down, we're down kind of pretty much. This just got published um, this year in pediatrics. So we were showing our kind of 10-year, um, our 10-year uh, event, our 10-year events. And what's actually interesting is this is ongoing work. So quality never stops. 
we just went you know, from a active mode into a sustained mode, so we're sustaining the gains that we've had. And if we um, have another spike, we go back and we, we create the wheel and kind of figure out what the problems are, and then we start all over. Um, so right now we're we're not in sustained mode, and just 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 as a curiosity, we're also this is one of the metrics that our hospital gets judged on when they look at the quality of care we give. Um, so closely tracked by everybody all the way up to leadership. So this is why it kind of made for a really great quality improvement project because everybody else in the nation is also looking at this metric. They all want to get their rates down too. So um, so moving forward, so. You'll notice quality improvement, and we always think of it as a team sport. So um, you've got the nurses, the docs, respiratory therapists, um, our frontline uh, staff. But who's missing from this picture? Patients and families. Patients and families are missing from this picture. So you think kind of what, 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 how do you integrate patients and families into quality or into something like this unplanned excavation? So I remember when I was doing this project, one of the um, one of the patients, the mother was there all the time. Two comes out at night. So the following day, I walked in and I asked her, I said, you know, can you just kind of walk me through the narrative? And sure enough, kind of walk me through the narrative and help me understand a little bit about what she saw and what was happening to the to the patient. So again, patience and quality makes absolute sense. So in quality, um, the other thing that we think about is we think about um, uh, we think about uh, sustainment, which is kind of you've done the project, everything is, is going well. We think about the second step after sustain is spread. So the next thing, thinking systematically, where are the other parts of the hospital that this could go to? So again, it's the other intensive care unit, so the pediatric intensive care unit and the cardiac intensive care unit, and that was a natural fit. And they're already, we're already involved in a collaborative um, to SPS. Code team. The code team. And, and OR. OR team, MRI, radiology, um, yeah. echo folks, mm -hmm. right? So anybody that comes by and, and touches the patient. So that we're thinking again, that's spread. So we're spreading it within our institution. But there's also scale up. So scale up means not just within our walls, but also outside our walls. Um, probably about six months ago, we were approached by the folks at Richmond, so VCU, and they asked us, they had an unplanned excavation rate of around uh, four, four per 100. Our rates are less than one, so benchmark is less than one. So their question was, what are you guys doing for, uh, what are you guys doing that we're not doing? We've tried the tape bang, we've tried the tape bang, we've tried the education, we've tried the tape bang, and it's just not going anywhere. So eventually we asked them to um, come to Children's, we had a phone call, and then they came to Children's and we uh, showed them the video, we did a simulation with them, and, um, and they took all of that back, and with their team they, um, they decided to implement some of the stuff that we were doing. And you can see here, this was presented at PAS um, this year from Baltimore, and these are their rates. This is Dr. Um, Hendricks just sent this last week. Very super excited. So we've um, managed to also move outside our walls, and this is what quality is all about. It's kind of it's about learning. Um, I'll teach, I'll learn, and dissemination of, of ideas. Um, so again, this for me was another step up in, in in terms of not just application but also integration with other, not just our hospital system but others. And then the last thing is, you know, how does this all story whole fit in with education? Well, throughout this initiative, Respiratory Care Services, Alex developed this video because he had a problem. Um, the respiratory therapists are new. Every few months there's a new person coming on. How do we get them all throughout the building to take the same way? So we can't, we can do one-on-one, -on -one, but wouldn't it be cool if we just had a way to we had just one video where we could sit and teach and, and kind of show, the, show it to, us, to them. So if you're really thinking about scholarship and education, you could take this another way. You could put this up on our website and look at the num number of downloads and look at the ratings uh, by the reviewers and the learners. Or you could do scholarship and education where you're looking at three teaching methods. If I give you the video and I give you the video with a simulation or I give you the video with just-in-time training and then I go to the website and look at the tubes and see how well you take them. You've got an objective measure of success of your educational intervention. And better still, if I wanted to 
look at the number of tubes coming out and patient outcomes, that would be in direct correlation with education and patient outcomes, which would be super cool. Haven't done this yet, thinking about it, but um, just to just to show you another another aspect of kind of taking it and turning it on its side. So you can take unplanned extubations, you can look, it could be discovery, it could be clinical care, it could be team science, it could also be education. Just for one that's like clinical problem. Thanks so much.
So, um, again, nice thing about it is it's adaptable. We don't have pre-plans before the study and after the study. We have, as the study goes on, we're, we're doing our PDSAs and we're changing our technique, and it's still valuable. Um, I wanted to kind of um, touch on something you said about measurement. That's what differentiates clinical care in general from quality, that measurement piece. So if you're measuring the screens, the suicide screens that you're doing and you're looking at the processes, so for example, this month you had 20%, next month you have 40%. What is it that made this 20, what made this 40, and how do I get it to 100%? So that's, that's the quality piece of it. That's, that's kind of moving it forward on a systems basis. So it's all about um, measuring what you're doing to a certain extent. Do you have a bridging both worlds, being in the clinical unit and QI, being part of these collaboratives, um, which are funded and, and result publications, how, to, to the question, not necessarily streams of funding, but the worlds and how they interact, what are your sort of observations on um, how it's been living in both worlds, how writ large and then here, and, and things that, uh, can be done to further the collaboration? So to, to your point about funding, um, there is funding in quality. It's just you have to look for the mechanisms. And, um, and I think people have taken quality more on the clinical sense, like this is something we do to improve the, our efficiency, our um, patient satisfaction in the, in, the, in, the, in the unit in general, but they haven't really been looking at quality improvement research. They haven't taken it to, to the next level. Um, there are funding mechanisms. There are several funding mechanisms. Can you point that I'm a co-investigator on an HRQ, which, which, is, which, which is but yeah. taking the, and it's on yeah. taking the blood pressure in primary care and getting the children referred. This is the second HRQ grant, the Agency of Health Research and Quality, which is a federal institute. I believe they have high interest. Um, the federal indirect. The federal that's important. And um, Dr. Rinky has two, had, Rinky had two of these. Yeah. So there, there, but again, having, um, formulating it in such a way that you are addressing, again, a problem that they're also interested in, whether it's through, you know, again, you can build in use of simulation to move along a quality project, but there is funding, there is funding in it. Um, I think you probably just have to look. What, what there isn't funding for, um, I'm going to put a shameless plug in for medical education. Um, mm -hmm. Medical education is one of the harder um, because it's not clinically, you know, clinically driven. Those tend to be harder to, um, those grants tend to be harder. It's harder to get med pure medical education to, to get funded. Again, you have to show a patient outcome, which is, which is also where we kind of stumble. Mm -hmm. so that to me is much harder than, than quality. Although one of the prompts for this whole consideration is the faculty member who is actually sending a K to NICHD around the medical education that you're right. It sure. involves yeah. how mm -hmm. you're going to improve mm -hmm. knowledge of the care providers that will empower the patients with information. Mm -hmm. And it looks, and, um, and again, another area, like gray area, you've probably heard about physician burnout. That's kind of a big hot topic these days. Um, that's one where, um, it could be directly linked to patient outcomes, and there are meta-analyses to that effect. But again, you have to kind of strike the right chord with the right uh, grant funding mechanism to, and those are both medical education, because again, physician burnout, that's resident medical student all the way up to um, attendees and so forth. Um, so that also is another hot, hot button issue right now. Any final questions? Any final words of wisdom? <laughs> there were many. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.